It has never happened, cannot be construed to mean it can never happen. As well say, because I have never broken my leg, my leg is unbreakable. Or, because I've never died, I am immortal. One thinks first of some great plague of insects, locusts or grasshoppers, when the species suddenly increases out of all proportion, and then just as dramatically sinks to a tiny fraction of what it has recently been. The higher animals also fluctuate. The lemmings work upon their cycle. The snowshoe rabbits build up through a period of years until they reach a climax when they seem to be everywhere. Then, with dramatic suddenness, their pestilence falls upon them. Some zoologists have even suggested a biological law that the number of individuals in a species never remains constant but always rises and falls. The higher the animal and the slower its breeding rate, the longer its period of fluctuation. During most of the 19th century, the African buffalo was a common creature on the veldt. It was a powerful beast, with few natural enemies, and if its senses could have been taken by decades, it would have proved to be increasing steadily. Then, toward the century's end, it reached its climax, and was suddenly struck by a plague of rinderpest. Afterward, the buffalo was almost a curiosity, extinct in many parts of its range. In the last fifty years, it has again slowly built up its numbers. As for man, there is little reason to think that he can, in the long run, escape the fate of other creatures. And if there is a biological law of flux and reflux, his situation is now a highly perilous one. During ten thousand years, his numbers have been on the upgrade in spite of wars, pestilences, and famines. This increase in population has become more and more rapid. Biologically, man has for too long a time been rolling an uninterrupted run of sevens. When he awoke in the middle of the morning, he felt a sudden sense of pleasure. He had feared he would be sicker than ever, but he felt much better. He was not choking any more, and also his hand felt cooler. The swelling had gone down. On the preceding day, he had felt so bad, from whatever other trouble had struck him, that he had had no time to think about the hand. Now both the hand and the illness seemed better, as if the one had stopped the other, and they had both receded. By noon, he was feeling clear-headed, and not even particularly weak. He ate some lunch, and decided that he could make it down to Johnson's. He did not bother to pack up everything. He took his precious notebooks and his camera. At the last moment, also as if by some kind of compulsion, he picked up the hammer, carried it to the car, and threw it on the floor by his feet. He drove off slowly. Using his right hand as little as possible. At Johnson's, everything was quiet. He let the car roll to a stop at the gasoline pump. Nobody came out to fill his tank, but that was not peculiar because the Johnson pump, like so many in the mountains, was tended on a haphazard basis. He blew the horn and waited again. After another minute, he got out and went up the rickety steps, which led to the room serving as an informal store where campers could pick up cigarettes and canned goods. He went in, but there was nobody there. He had a certain sense of surprise, as often when he had been by himself for a while, he was not exactly sure what day it might be. Wednesday, he thought, but it might be Tuesday or Thursday. Yet he was certain that it was somewhere in the middle of the week, not a Sunday. On a Sunday, or even for a whole weekend, the Johnsons might possibly shut up the store and go somewhere on a trip of their own. They were easygoing and did not believe too strongly in letting business interfere with pleasure. Yet they were really dependent, to a large extent, upon the sales which the store made during the fishing season. They could hardly afford to go away very long. And if they had gone on a vacation, they would have locked the door. Still, you never could tell about these mountain people. The incident might even be worth a paragraph in his thesis.